I can still remember the first high school class I ever attended. It was Mr. Jones's advanced world history class. Mr. Jones was a big guy, broad shoulders, deep voice, and he had this dark, tightly groomed goatee that matched his small, dark glasses. And I remember his classroom was in the back of the school on the second floor, overlooking all the sports fields, which was perfect, because that's where I wanted to be anyway. You see, I was the energetic kid. I was the kid who would pretend to go to the bathroom every period, just so that I can go move my legs, get a sip of water, and I knew this wasn't good for my learning, but I was a decent enough student. I got by. If you found me in class, I would probably either be doodling, mostly a monster truck jumping through a ring of fire, or I would be mashing in ones and zeros into my calculator all period long, so that at the end, I could hit enter, and it would scroll through it, and it would look like code in the matrix. And I thought that was pretty cool, so needless to say, I was a pretty big nerd. And so when I went into Mr. Jones's classroom, I grabbed a seat in the back where I can get away with all these minor infractions and not have to worry about anything. But the thing is, Mr. Jones knew that the world history curriculum was pretty long and we had to hit the ground running. So we assigned a couple of chapters in the textbook for the summer. And when I walked into the classroom, the first sight I saw was him sitting at his desk, leaned back, and he had a stack of bright yellow papers on his desk. And the first thing he said to these little ninth graders was, welcome to high school. You may now come up to the front and hand in your summer assignment. And if you don't have your summer assignment, you can take one of these pre-signed course removal forms and you can get out of my class. And I remember one thought running through my head, I hate this guy, I don't want to be <laughs> in his classroom. I want to be back at the middle school with the teachers I already love, with my friends, and I don't want to be here. This is way too high of stakes. And I had completed the summer assignment. I had nothing to fear. And yet, I remember everyone completing the summer assignment. And he had this huge stack of papers on his desk as if he was ready to kick out two-thirds of the class. And now that I remember, or I look back on it, I remember Mr. Jones being a really good teacher. When he told stories, he was vivid and would bring you to the places that we would talk about. His assignments were extremely creative, and they're ones that I remember to this day. And I don't even remember some of my favorite teacher's assignments. But yet, every first period, I would dread going into his classroom because of that first power move that first chess piece that he moved that said, this is my classroom, you obey my rules, and if you don't, you can get out. And now that I've become a teacher, I've realized that I don't condemn Mr. Jones for what he did. In fact, I can see it in a new light, and I th that's what I want to share with you today. That now that I've become a teacher, I've realized that there are things within the classroom, actions that are made, that students and that teachers perceive completely differently. And teachers do things for a reason, and sometimes students don't see why teachers do that. It's almost like I want to aspire to be like the medical field, where in the medical field, you know exactly what is gonna happen next. When you go into the doctor's office, they tell you what is wrong with you, they tell you what they're gonna do to you, and then they say why what they're doing to you is going to remedy whatever is wrong with you. And you are on the same page all the way throughout. Right? The stethoscope doesn't touch your chest until you know it's not going to hurt, and you know it's just so that they can hear your heartbeat. But sometimes in the education field, it feels like the teacher knows where the finish line is. They say, I can see beyond the trees. And if you just follow along, kids, we'll get there. And at the end, I'll tell you to turn around you'll look at all the paths we took, and we'll all be happy. And so, I want to, as a sense of removing the curtains behind some of the things that frustrated me as a student, and so I have three of the top things that made me aggravated. And so the first curtain that I want to remove behind education is one that is extremely prevalent, 
something that if you've spent the last decade in a classroom, you know that it's there every day, and that's cell phones. Now, if you're a student, you have definitely heard the cell phone talk from a teacher before, um, but I think that my perspective on cell phones is a little bit different. See, I knew what it was like to have a smartphone in high school. I might be one of the only teachers that has that experience from both sides. I remember what it was like putting your backpack on your desk, not because you wanted to get your books out quicker, but because you have your phone behind it and you're texting, and no, you cannot have your backpack on your desk in my classroom, I'm sorry. And I remember running my headphones up my shirt and down my sleeve so I could put my hand on my cheek and listen to music without my teacher knowing. Now there's just AirPods, which is a whole other thing, but it is something that even though I did it all the time in high school, I remember using it, and my cell phone is a huge part of my life today. In fact, I even wrote this speech after midnight on a school night in the notes section of my phone when I got the inspiration for it. But yet, when I teach and I tell students to put their phone away, I'm still met with eye rolls and scoffs. And I wonder if I did the same thing when I was a student. And when I tell students to put phones away, it is not in the sense of the Mr. Jones, it is my classroom, you have to obey. But it's the sense of, I could see how terrible of a relationship it is between students and phones. You see, when I teach physics, it is inevitable that students are going to hit hurdles. It's part of the subject. It's part of every subject. And when students hit hurdles in their learning, the first thing they look for is comfort. And comfort is so easily ready so at the touch of your fingertips when you have your phone. I've seen the most focused of students when they're in the middle of a problem and their phone's on their desk and they get a notification and it lights up, their eyes just drift to it. It's unstoppable. I like to think of it like constantly going back to the fridge over and over again, even though you know nothing in the fridge is satisfying your craving and yet you still do it because it's something to do. But the problem with these fridges is, one, they could fit in our pocket, and two, there is always something to, cons to consume. <clears throat> There's always a feed to refresh or a new picture to look at, and that is extremely dangerous for students trying to overcome hurdles in the classroom. It will always be a detriment to focusing and excelling through. So that's the first curtain. The second curtain I want to talk about is one that when I was a student used to almost always just make me not want to start an assignment the instant it was assigned, and that is the rigid deadlines or the rigid guidelines behind an assignment. The I will not take it unless it's 11 point font, aerial, half inch margins with a cover letter, and if you don't have it, you're not handing it in. And when I was a student, it always felt like I was a dog at a dog show, where the teacher was like, jump through, dogs, and they were holding up a hula hoop for no reason, just to satisfy their, I don't know, desire or their entertainment to watch you jump through, and there was nothing on the other side to actually accomplish. But as a teacher, I've realized that there is a purpose to that, and there is a meaning. You see, when you're in high school, you are surrounded by people who share vastly different interests than you. Everyone in your class might pursue different careers. But the further you go down your career, the more you will realize that things start filtering out. If you go into the job force or you go into college, you might be in a classroom with all people pursuing the same major as you. And at the end of that major, while you do work together and collaborate, you might be going for the same jobs as the people within your class. And if you get that job, you might be going for the same raise that the people within your job are also pursuing. And sometimes in life, you don't get to dictate the rules. Sometimes you don't get to dictate the guidelines behind what you have or don't have to do. You can write the best scientific paper in the world, and if you don't have a good abstract, you're not going to get published. If you don't know how to format your resume correctly, you will never be in the too higher pile. And that's scary, because while you are competing against these people, you don't want to be the person who can't jump through the hoop. And so I think teachers see this, have experienced it, and just want students to be able to jump through those hoops when they come. 
So that's the second hurdle. The third hurdle is one that when I brought up in the teacher's lounge, the teachers were like, you're going to really talk about that? And I was like, yes, yes I am. Um, and even in my young career, I have gotten this question. It is the student raising their hand and saying, Mr. P, when will I ever use this in my life? And I had those same questions when I was in high school. And since I've taught, I have realized that there's only one answer that I think is the most appropriate. If, I, if you ask me when you will ever use the equation for kinetic energy or a random fact about an Ottoman Empire, I will tell you, you probably won't. Now, that's not to say you should throw tomatoes at every teacher who, have, who has told you otherwise, or like burn the education system to the ground, but it's the truth. You might not ever use the formula for kinetic energy, but that doesn't mean education as a whole is worthless. You see, I value more learning what it means to think like the professional that you are studying, rather than memorizing the facts within that profession. I don't want every one of my students to be a physicist. The world doesn't need that many ones and zeros type matrix kids. It's just, we just don't. But you better believe that if a student wants to pass my class, they're going to have to learn what it means to think like a physicist. They're going to have to analyze the natural world and see what assumptions we can make and how those assumptions can help solve problems you better go into English class learning how to be a poet, or learning how to be an artist, or learning how to be a historian, or learning how to be a mathematician, because that is more valuable to you than memorizing the quadratic formula. Now, memorizing that is a step to becoming knowing what it means to think like a mathematician. And I realized this when a student asked me a question that at the time seemed meaningless. They asked me, Mr. P, if I can go back to high school, and take one class over, what class would I take? And it didn't even seem significant to the student at the time, but I told him that I would go back and I would take Mr. Jones's advanced world history course. Because while I passed that course and I memorized those facts, I never truly meant, or I never truly learned what it meant to think like a historian. And to this day, I even struggle with understanding why history influences the current international relations between countries, or why certain countries take their own domestic policies differently than others. And while I passed his course, I never really got the true value out of it. And I think if we can see education in this light and realize that students and teachers are not against each other, but on the same team, then maybe we can rectify the differences with the Mr. Joneses in our past maybe education as a whole can feel more meaningful. Thank you.